I'm a GIB's chief, GIB's chief executive and delighted to be chairing today's event. Firstly, um, if we could move the slide on. So we have got, as you see, a very packed agenda, um, which we'll be covering. You'll see there is a dedicated Q&A, which, which I'll um, clarify how that will work. Um, next slide. Firstly, I'm really well, you know, delighted to be joined by two eminent presenters, Dan Self, partner at Behringer's, and our very own Richard Justum, Employment Relations Manager, who delighted joined the GIB back in July. Um, so today, um, I wanted to really make sure that we get behind the headlines, which we've all read about the Chancellor's autumn budget and, and the spending review, which was delivered on the 27th of October and really try to give you um, some analysis of what this actually means for your, for, for you, for, for your business and, and individually. The Chancellor in his budget statement stated that we're entering a post-COVID age of optimism. And while the construction industry has played a vital role in helping the UK recover, there are economic headwinds that are facing our sector as we start to emerge out of the pandemic. Interesting, one of the most notable boosts for the Chancellor was the improved economic forecast um, from the Office of Budget Responsibility, which has undoubtedly given Mr Sunak some scope for flexibility. And we'll hear a little bit more about our, from our speakers a little bit about what that actually means. I mean, the budget has also targeted um, at the nation's green jobs and skills, and you'll be hearing from Richard what this actually means for our sector and get behind some of the statements the Chancellor made. Um, in closing, I just wanted to say, you know, our industries isn't just about um, helping construct safer built environments, but it plays an important and significant role in supporting jobs, growth and helping to tackle climate change, which I'm sure we'll discuss further during the Q&A. Um, and, and as I said, we have got a dedicated Q&A. And just to remind delegates that if you could hold all your questions until we reach the Q&A, um, perhaps areas you want more clarity or more information on. Um, and I'm sure some of you in joining us are seasoned Zoom users, but if you're not, there is a Q&A um, box on, on your screen. If you could use that to post your questions to the presenters, but please feel free to post any comments, observations you might want, want to uh, make. And I think really make the most of the experience and insight our speakers bring. So um, next slide, um, if we could um, get the event underway, really, if I could hand over to you, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Um, hello, everyone. Yeah, we're just gonna uh, run through the budget and the announcements that he made previously to the budget because there was not really a lot in the budget with regards to tax. So it was all announced before. There was a few little things in there. So I'm just gonna do a quick run through of everything um, for you. So to start with income tax, um, there's already the announced that they changed the dividend rates um, from April, 2022. They, these are gonna be increased by 1.25% across the board. Um, but to obviously tailor that in, the, na uh, the national insurance rates as well will be increased by the same percentage. So employees and I and employers and I will both be going up by the same rate and also self-employed people are not missing out on this either. Um, so it will, that will increase to 10.25 and 3.25% over the basic rate threshold. So it's an increase across the board, um, whether you're a sole trader, but trading via a limited company, um, it should negate any tax planning opportunities um, and it will still be the same as before. Um, other thresholds remain unchanged. Um, these are all going to be the same as they were prior, prior to the budget, um, and the only increases are the ones mentioned above. Um, making tax digital is always something that pops up every budget. They really want to implement this and get things into a digital age, and this has been deferred again till April 2024. This, this will increase, this, I'm not surprised if this will change again and get delayed further, but that, that's what date we're at here at the moment. And along with that, they're, um, they're really forming the accounting period. So all sole traders will now have a 5th of April 2024, uh, effectively year end. And whether you had a September, December, any year end, that's all gonna now be April to coincide with the tax year. 23-24 uh, will be a transitional year. So in that year, you probably will expect to pay more tax um, due to the fact that you'll be paying for your normal accounting period, plus the period after that up to the end of the year. Therefore, it's uh, highly recommended that you find your overlap relief or start looking now. Um, this overlap relief was calculated when you first started trading 
or if you tra started trading a very long time ago, it would be around about the 97, 98 year, there was a transitional period there as well. So please ask your accountants if you don't know what that is, because this will need to be used when your accounting period changes. As I said, this will increase into higher liabilities, um, but profits will be spread over five years. We're not quite sure how they're gonna show this yet, but the main reason behind that is to stop people going from basic rate to higher rate on some of their liabilities when they wouldn't normally. Um, this is automatic and you have to elect to opt out. So if you wanted to pay it all in one go, um, you can elect to do so, um, but normally this will be spread over five years. Um, next slide, please. So the other side is the corporation tax. So they've increased uh, the corporation tax rate to 25% from April, 2023. This was announced prior to the budget. Um, however, their 19% tax rate remains for profits up to 50,000. Between 50 and 250,000, it's the return of the marginal rate. Um, therefore, your effective rate increases the higher profits go. Um, this will also be included with the associated companies. So for associated companies, that is uh, companies that are owned by other companies or companies that are owned by the same people, you need to factor in all the associated companies uh, to calculate the effective rate. Uh, deferred tax uh, that is currently shown in accounts, they will need to be uh, reviewed due to the fact that the CT rate is going up. So when you come to do your accounts next year, you may see some sharp increases in deferred tax. This will just uh, go forward as and when. Uh, there is a new UK residential property developer tax of 4%. Profits more than only only for companies more profits more than 25 million will be affected. Um, so I, I don't know if that's any of you guys, but if you are, then great having a have a quite a high um, have quite a high profit. Don't, don't forget your COVID temporary carry back rules. These were announced uh, during lockdown. Any accounting periods ending between the 1st of April 2020 and 31st of March 2022 can take advantage of these. Uh, this is where you can carry back the losses up to three years on a last in basis. And this is very lucrative for companies that have suddenly made a loss and the previous years have been creating gain uh, profits and therefore you can get some tax back there. You may want to consider changing your accounting period. Uh, this is due to if say for instance, you had a 31st of May 2022 year end, you could shorten your uh, period to the 31st of March. And if unfortunately you made a loss in that year, that loss can also be uh, make use of the temporary carry back rules. Uh, annual investment allowance has um, been extended to 31st of March 2023. This was due to reduce down um, at the end of December, but they've increased it to um, encourage people to spend on plant and machinery and, and keep the economy going. Um, this also applies to sole traders as well. Um, this super deduction of 130% has come into play from April 2021. Um, this is where you get 130% relief on, on purchases um, that of any plant and machinery, capital allowances, capital assets that fall into the main rate pool. Um, therefore, it's vital to check the purchase date to ensure that you know when you've purchased it and if it falls in prior to April or, or post April. Um, we do recommend using the super deduction in priority to the AIA due to the increased uh, relief that you get, uh, but obviously use AIA for special rate pools or assets um, that don't fall into the main rate pool. Please note these are temporary reliefs. So up to 2023, the, the, they are very vital to be used and make the most of them before they're gone. So um, next slide, please. Just a quick point on capital gains tax. There wasn't any changes in the, in the budget at all. Uh, it was very surprising actually, due to the fact that we felt that business asset disposal relief or entrepreneurs relief as people still call it would, would go. Um, it used to be 10 million lifetime limit. It, it's only now a million, um, but that's still there. So for people considering liquidating or retiring, there is still that end game of a 10% rate up to a million pounds, um, which is quite lucrative considering capital gains tax rates are 20% and they could go up. Um, there was rumors they were gonna go up, but they have kept them the same for now. Um, there's a reporting requirement for sale of UK residential properties. As you know, you now have to um, submit a CGT return and pay the tax within 30 days. This has been extended to 60 days with effect from the budget. I think the main point of this is, is people were struggling to do it within 30 days due to the complexity of logging in and setting up a government gateway, getting your accountant if you have an accountant to get set up. So therefore, they've just done an extra 30 days there, which is a welcome relief. Um, final point on capital gains tax, the mixed use properties, only the residential part is reportable within the 60 days, the rest of it can be put on your tax return and dealt with it um, as usual. Uh, next slide please. 
Just a quick point on R&D. Uh, this is becoming more prominent in all sectors, actually. Um, they've extended it to include data and cloud computing um, due to the fact that this is this is up and coming and a lot of, lot of uh, money is being spent on R&D through this. However, they want to focus on UK spending. Uh, they are restricting the relief to overseas. We're not quite sure what they're going to do yet, but they want people, encourage people to spend in the UK and get your relief for spending the money in this country. Uh, we, as an accountant, have seen an increase in R&D claims throughout all sectors um, over the last few years. And this is mainly due to the R&D um, specialist firms that are out there where they they sort of prepare a 30 40 page report um, and blind you with science and they sort of put the onus on the client we've seen saying that the client the client has a competent professional we've discussed it with them and it sort of puts the blame not blame but puts it on them in case the revenue ever come along so I would be aware about these and just just having a word with your accountant before you you go along these lines would be my um, my suggestion and along with this HMRC are are tackling the abuse and they want to improve compliance so they will be releasing something later this year to see how they will tackle abuse and improve compliance and I'm looking forward to seeing that um, next slide please and finally um, the business rates so there is um, a temporary relief for retail hospitality and leisure um, eligible properties will receive 50% relief up to a cap of £110,000 per business um, this is um, coinciding with the lockdown and the pattern pandemic. Um, they will be revaluing um, asset, uh, properties, business rates every three years as opposed to five. Um, we've recently had a review for clients and ourselves and we found that we were overpaying. So if you do feel you're overpaying, I would definitely look into this and see if you can get any money back plus paying reduced rates going forward. Um, but a vital thing for the sector is that from 2023, 100% uh, improvement relief for business rates will provide 12 months relief for eligible improvements when that increases the rateable value. So that, that sort of delays it for another 12 months, which is good news. Um, VAT, hospitality are, are benefiting from the reduced rate at present, but this is going back to 20% in March 2022 and doesn't look like that will change. As we know, um, fuel has been slowly increasing over the past few weeks, but good news is that they've frozen the duty, which means there won't be any uh, sharp increases straight away. Alcohol duty, um, they've reformed this as it was outdated. Effectively, the stronger the drink, the more the tax. Minimum wage is increased to £9.50 from £8.91 per hour, which is going coincides with the Parliament's pledge to increase minimum wage um, throughout their term. And finally, universal credit. Uh, this is been reduced from a 63% restriction to 55% restriction for every one pound earned. So that's an extra 8p increase for every one, one pound earned. Um, I think that's my last slide. So uh, back to you, Jay. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, I, oh, we always learn something new when we listen to you, Dan. So thanks, <laughs> thanks for um, distilling, which was a, lot of, a very rich uh, budget and, and spending reviews, as we said, covering that. So that's been, and I'm sure delegates will want to raise a number of points because yep. you covered quite a quite areas of concern for, for us and interest, yep. which I'm sure delegates. And again, just to remind um, attendees, we have a Q&A session. So after Richard's presentation, if you could start, you know, posting your questions and we'll, we'll make sure we get around to them. So over to you, Richard. Thank you, Jay. Um, next slide, please, Roger. Right. Um, it's interesting. The government seems to have changed direction, but in some ways, certainly the rhetoric is positive. What they're talking about now is a high wage, high skill economy, which would be something that I'm sure our delegates would welcome because the electrical industry is a high skilled industry. I'll start by going through some of the high level figures. I mean, spending is going to increase by 3.8 billion by 24, 25. What that is, it's an increase of 42%, 26% in real terms. Breaking it down a bit, 1.6 billion is going to be invested in the new T levels for 16 to 19 year olds. There's going to be 580 million for adult skills which will include the half a million adults that need literacy and numeracy um, skill development. There's gonna be 850 million to revamp and modernize the further education colleges, many of which are crumbling, so the infrastructure is being invested in. There's 2.7 increase for apprenticeships, which I'm gonna be talking about a little bit more 
before 24, 25. And there's going to be 30 billion that's being earmarked for the new green industries. It's estimated that this funding will quadruple the number of places on skills boot camps, expand the lifetime skills guarantee on free level three qualifications and improve numerous key skills through the new multiply program. Next slide, please. In particular, we're talking about adult skills and T-levels. I mean, first of all, I'll say a few things about T-levels. It's felt that these need to be clearly defined and, and signposted as pathways to higher and degree apprenticeships. At the moment, it's felt to be a bit vague what they're going to be and, and how they relate to MVQs. So they're still being developed and they're not proven at the moment. Adult skills, as well as the literacy and numeracy in the electrical sector, it's felt that level three occupational qualifications, which could lead to gold cards, could be helped. And I'd said earlier about further education colleges, the infrastructure needs renewal and updating. Next slide, please. Going on to apprenticeships, the government have said that they'll continue to pay at least 90 5% of the training cost for the smaller employers that do not pay the uh, apprentice levy and that they want to actually have improvements for all employers that want to take on apprentices. There's an enhanced recruitment service by May 2022 for new apprentices and they want to create flexible apprenticeship training which fits the needs of employers. And the unspent funds, they're looking to see how that could also be used to support some of their numeracy objectives that we talked about earlier. And the £3,000 apprentice hiring incentive has been extended to 2022. Next slide, please. And here we have a, a chart which actually puts it in, I think, a very concise way you can see how firms under 50 employers, firms between 50 and 100, and then the levy payers would benefit from the various 16 to 18, 19 to 24, and then the 25s and over. Next slide, please. I'm asking the question, really, is this enough? And also, as we've got COP26 going on in Glasgow as we're speaking, how will the government create the new green industries of the future? The electronic industry is a green industry, which has, I think, a very bright future in that. I mean, it's estimated that there needs to be 10,000 to 15,000 extra apprentices within the next 10 years. And that is actually just to be a standstill because a lot of people in our industry will be retiring in that time frame. Some of the green experts were disappointed that the government didn't incentivize better consumer behavior in the budget. One example would be when we've talked about aviation, there's been no penalty for, let's say, domestic flights, flights that could be on journeys that have, can also be done by rail. There was no explicit mention of a net zero strategy in the budget, despite COP26. And it's felt that there's lots of inconsistent messages. And potentially, there could be a knowledge gap that's created over the next few years. There also hasn't really been a definition of what a green job is, despite the fact that the government have a target of supporting 440,000 jobs by 2030. My question is, is this a missed opportunity? And again, to quote one of the um, slogans of COP26, you know, it's action and not words. It, it feels like, as I said in my first slide, the rhetoric is all very well, but actually, is that actually being backed up by action? Thank you. Richard, thank, thank you for that. That's, uh, again, um, covered quite a lot there. So we'll, I'm sure, try to unpick that as we go through but thanks for sharing your insights and your um you know whittling us through the um the, the complex uh, 
uh, a red red book from from the chancellor so that's helpful right so this is where we make the um event i think a little bit more interactive um and an opportunity really for us to hear from the attendees so again just remind if you could post your questions and we'll make sure we get around to as many as we can again um you know i'm always mindful that sometimes these things take um um quite important but i think a little bit of time so if we don't get around to you, all your questions we'll make sure the presenters at least get back to you off offline so do post post that um whilst we're waiting for the questions to appear um dan what one question for you one one of the things that you may have picked up is that the a monthly survey of the construction purchasing managers indicates that the supply headwinds remain um but the worst may be perhaps be over now um I, I, are you surprised that the bank of england held interest rates last friday and um sorry multiple questions and do, do, do you think that sort of indicates that the economy is still recovering and we should be less worried about the inflationary pressures that we've been hearing a lot about um yeah i think it's a bit of both to be honest with you um obviously the, the inflation we see at the moment is mainly due to the supply problems um um, raising energy costs and increased labour costs. So we can see why the inflation is happening. Um, however, they did mention um, regarding the, the bank, the interest rate that we haven't really seen the full effects of furlough scheme ending yet. So we're waiting to see hmm. um, the full effects of that, see if there is a, a higher redundancy risk or actually it has recovered to a, to a premium amount. So I think what they're doing is sitting on their hands a little bit um, and just sort of just waiting and seeing. And, but I do, I do feel quite positive that we are recovering um, in my sector. Anyway, um, we can see that, a lot of people are starting to do a bit more tax planning now where that sort of stopped um, throughout lockdown. And now it seems to be slowly, slowly coming back. So I feel like, yeah, we are on the right track. Um, and and the base rate may may obviously increase uh, in the future uh, or quite soon. But I think they're just waiting and seeing, in my opinion. OK, no, that's helpful. Um, and again, it's a bit, bit of... Um guesswork I suspect how, how they how, how things um, start to move but that's helpful um we've got a question um I'm not sure Richard whether you want to pick up on this, this yeah no, I'm, the, I'm happy yeah could, could Neil's asking could you discuss the thousand pound incentive for taking t-level learners on a 40 45 day placement I think this actually encapsulates one of the remarks I made and I'm quite happy to pick up any detail with Neil outside the uh, the podcast but people I've spoken to feel that T-levels are not proven at the moment they are quite vague they're one of these like whenever there's changes in qualifications and education it's sometimes felt again that the rhetoric might not meet the substance and some of the training providers I've spoken to that they're not anti T levels but some of the detail they that they're still thinking needs to be worked through so this could be one of those sort of areas where it you know it, it still hasn't really been clearly defined but as I said I'm more than happy to pick this up with Neil outside the um, webinar and um, you know discussing you know exactly yeah. what what the future of T levels are. And also how that thousand pound for the four-day yeah, place yeah. would, 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 would actually operate. Okay. Um, and, and just on the subject of T-levels, Richard, what's your sort of, do, do you, you know, I know the ECS scheme is mapping that across and, you know, be working with IF it, um, to, to help look at that. But do you think the GRB could be doing a little bit more to help raise awareness, make sure that employers understand? Yeah, no, I, 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 absolutely. I think, I think we've, we've got to, try and raise awareness because T levels are mm. going to be the future. Mm. And, you know, it, it, it's quite funny, depending on when we all went through education, we all seem to remember what, let's say, the education structure was when we went through it. And then sort of mapping that across later, you know, it, it is sometimes quite interesting. And that's why T levels, that, that they're going to be the new you know, they're, they're, they're the new qualification, which I think the government seems really keen on. And as I as I mentioned in my slides, they've, they're committing a lot of money to it. Hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I guess, you know, just, just on that, you know, what's, it's great that the government are looking at education and skills. 
it's got to be fit for purpose. It's got to work for Absolutely. our industry. And, and that, so, so the and feedback, that, yeah. Yeah, and that and that's and, and at the moment we don't know that about T levels. I mean, no. let's hope that T levels are developed in a way that they actually are even better than the current system. But you know, it's always one of these things about change, isn't it? Whenever there is a change, people get a little bit anxious. So at the moment, the jury's out on whether that anxiety has justification or okay. or not. Okay, so it's a good opportunity perhaps for us to engage with members and listen, listen to their thoughts on that. Um, Dan, we've got a question. I think it's quite a populist question in our sector with um, yep. the GIB supporting direct employment. With the chance of sort of, as you say, trailing the, um, the rise in national insurance next year or, or, or in a April coming up, um, people asking questions around how does this actually interact with the self-employed? Okay. And particularly around um, umbrella companies, is that going to apply there, Dan? Um, yeah, so as they um, increase the national insurance rates, they've also increased the dividend rates as well. So effectively, it's an increase across the board. So whether you were considering being a sole trader or a limited company, if you're doing it in the most beneficial way, uh, the increase uh, rises across everything so there isn't any change there um, with regards to what you mentioned about the umbrella companies they they would obviously um, run a payroll for for the, the certain individual and the NI would have would would increase on the on the payroll there the employers NI also increases as well um, which basically means they may miss out on they might have a lower take home pay than they would have done um, compared to being directly employed as well because employers NI increasing and employees NI gives them a lower uh, wage packet overall. Yeah, no. And, and I know we were talking before we kicked off the webinar with the furlough, as, as we say, just generally, how do you think the chance sort of mindset is with how he treats self employed given what he's learned through the furlough? And do you, are you seeing any difference in approach there, Dan? Um, well, obviously, when it first came out, the furlough was the first thing to be announced and all the self-employed people said, well, what about us? So they they then got the 80% through there as well. So it sort of, again, leveled the playing field with that. Um, I have noticed a few compliance checks recently with regards to self-employment, because when you do your tax return, the revenue already know about your, your grants. So if they don't match up, then you, you're going to be considered to be looked into. Um, but with regards to the furlough, uh, as we've now finished, there have been a few um, chaser letters um, to do with inquiries and mm -hmm. uh, sort of just checking the calculations and I'm not sure whether that's because there's something flagging at their system that means that you've overclaimed, um, or it is gen generically just picking on random clients to see see what's happening. But I feel that there will be a rate a, a, a number of um, compliance checks with regards to furlough because um, they they know that it has been abused as much as the self employment. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. That's 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 something to to um, um, watch out for. Um, <laughs> Richard, on the on the you you, you touched on um, the whole. I guess what I was I was picking up was a lack of a clear strategy on the green jobs, the green skills. Do do, do you think this piecemeal funding that the chancellor's announced is the right approach? And if not, what could he be doing differently? It, it's difficult, really. I mean, I, I'm not sure whether the piecemeal approach is accurate, and I, and I think I would want funding more incentivized around green jobs but also defining what green jobs are because mm. I looked quite a lot when preparing for this um, webinar and it, it sort of feels like it does quite a lot in the political world where they will say things that they think will play well with the public or play well with industry and it's what you said Jay about actually when you drill down those sound bites don't really respond. I mean, what I'd like to see was something rather than piecemeal, something a bit more, you know, substantial that would be, you know, directed towards incentivizing green jobs and, and actually incentivizing firms to go down the re what, what is said by rhetoric and what I agree with, which is the high wage, high skill. Mm. And certainly we're in an industry which is high skill and I think there's been a lot of concern that sometimes those skills have not been valued in the way that they should be. No, no, absolutely. And I guess 
also touches on your sort of closing remarks on um, COP26 and the net zero goals for 2050. Um, if we are to increase, as you say, capacity for competent skilled workforce, a lot more is going to be needed, I guess, than what Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Um, Dan, I'm going to fire a few questions before we're mindful of time. Um, how, how is the overlap relief calculated is a question being raised. Okay, um, yeah, so there's a couple of, um, well, there's one way of calculating it, but there's a couple of re uh, starting points. So uh, in if you've recently started to be self-employed, the overlap relief is calculated on your first year. So on your first year, you're taxed on an arising basis from the day you commenced self-employment to the 5th of April. The second year is uh, taxed on a 12 month basis. So effectively um, your profits are being taxed twice for a period. Um, that period there is your overlap relief. So for instance, if you started trading on the 1st of September, 2021, um, your first year will be from the 1st of September, 21 to the 5th of April. And then the second year, if you uh, will be to the 30th of uh, 31st of August and you go back 12 months. So there's a period there that's taxed twice. Um, when you change accounting year, or when this new reform comes in, you you will go to the 5th of April and that overlap, uh, overlap relief is there then be able to claim to reduce the profits. Um, if you are a long time sole trader, there was a transitional year in 1997-98 where you were, you were the transitional period, that's when the overlap relief was claimed. This should be, if you have an accountant, this should be on your file somewhere. But obviously if you've been, been trading for a very long time, um, it may not have got missed, but it is very vitally important to use because it's a very lucrative um, relief. Um, if you had profits quite high to start with, there may there may be a lot of profit there too that you've been taxed twice and not had relief on. Yeah, good. Um, there was one question. I'm mindful the clock's um, working against us, but I don't know if you can quickly touch on this. Yeah. The question is, what if my profit exceeds 50,000? How do I calculate my tax liability, if you can. For, for um, corporation tax, I assume that question's for. So um, what would happen is, is you have an effective rate, so it's a marginal relief. So what happens is, is you have your first 50,000 and the over 250,000 is the higher rate. And in between, effectively, it's a percentage and the uh, your accountant should be able to help with that. But your effective rate is probably higher than the, late, the last rate of 25%, but that's how it needs to be worked to work out your, your effective rate of tax. Good. Listen, um, we are running out of time, so um, I can't see any questions um, in the in the chat box. So really just want to close by thanking our delegates for your participation today and again, posing some great, great questions as always. But listen, this is not the, the end of the um, journey. If you do have any questions or other, other things that come up, please feel free to drop us a note and make sure you we can pick those questions up. With the presenters or if you want any more clarity we sure we can pick that up uh, just a reminder a, a recording of this webinar will be available following um after this the, once we've um, closed um available on the youtube channel so again if colleagues that weren't able to join or if you want to share any of the comments with colleagues internally then feel, feel free to do that um we will also after the um the, the webinar be posting a questionnaire and again, it's really important that we hear from you, um, particularly on you know, what you thought of today's webinar, but equally on what topics you'd like to see us cover in the future. It's really important that we cover the topics that are relevant and important to you and, and center front of your, your mind. So again, please let us know. We'll make sure we try to. So I want to close by really again, thanking our speakers um, and, um, today. I know it takes a lot of effort and time to prepare for this. So thank you. Thank you for your um, input today. And just want to thank the delegates uh, for joining us today and wish you a safe and productive day. Thank you.